morning, everyone. Hopefully you can hear us okay and you've managed to get joined in uh, to tonight's Zoom meeting. Um, so what, what the plan of attack is, so you'll all hopefully have read through before joining and know what we're up to tonight. Um, so we're going to be speaking about managing the yow for a successful lambing. Um, so when we're talking about lambing and yows, obviously the whole idea is to get good fleshy lambs out of your productive yows a good high, high, good high vigour um, and make sure your yows are in the right condition and whatnot for uh, and hopefully stress-free lambing or as stress-free as lambing can get anyway. Um, so what the agenda is tonight, um, we're going to have Poppy, who's a SEC grassland and sheep specialist, is going to be speaking to us a bit first and then Following on from Poppy, we're going to have Mary, who is uh, Mary Young, who is our um, one of our livestock nutritionists as well. Um, so just for the duration of the meeting, I'm just going to mute everybody just because we're expecting about 30 people to join in. So if I just mute everyone to begin with, it means there's no background noise and less interference um, from everybody else as we go through the meeting. Now, what we'll do is um, we're quite happy to take questions as we go through everything. But what I'll ask is if you use the chat function um, on your screen and just if messages, um, if questions pop into your head as we're going through it, please just fire them in the chat box. Um, myself and Emma will be keeping keeping an eye on things um, and we'll see what crops up as we go through. Um, apart from that, that's really all you'll hear from me at the minute. Um, and I'll just pass over to Poppy to start us off. Thanks, Stacey. I hope everyone can hear me okay. All good. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, so Mary and I are going to talk lambing success. So this may be a long way, I feel like a long way off of summer, it might be closer for many, but it's never too soon to start um, planning. And in fact, management now, of course, will influence lambing success. So Mary and I are going to talk through some key points as to what to think about now and towards lambing time um, to um, ensure you get those healthy, vigorous lambs, as Stacey nicely described. So what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to start with a bit on body condition scoring. I'm going to hand over to um, Mary to talk more about nutrition. And, um, and then I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about new behaviour and things we might want to consider for extreme weather as well. Now, Sorry, back one. Um, this is um, a useful resource that I consider a must have for anyone with a sheep flock. For some reason, um, my uh, PowerPoint's going, I don't know why, I don't know. <laughs> but anyways, this is a really useful resource for um, anybody with a, a sheep flock and it's a poster and it's a U Nutrition and Body Condition Timeline, which is freely available from QMS. So if anyone would like to request a copy from QMS, there's the um, email address there. And this is fantastic, the whole actual wealth of information and research that's gone into this. It breaks down the U pregnancy from tupping and the, into the three 50 day periods and even into lactation. Um, and straight away, you kind of see the priority areas in terms of nutrition. So we've got the golden 20 days, which is 10 days either side of tupping, and then the golden 35 days, which is what Mary will talk about in terms of the importance of quality nutrition in the lead up to lambing time. And then along the bottom, it talks about the new condition score targets. And really, most of the time, you're looking for a target of three to three and a half, not too fat, not too thin, um, throughout lambing for as much uh, throughout pregnancy um, as much as possible. Um, and we talk about condition scoring a lot and we talk about that for a reason. There's a whole host of research which has looked at comparing flocks that or comparing animals within a flock that have been under condition to those over condition. Um, at SRUC, they've identified that target condition score is influential to ewe mortality. They found those on target uh, led to 5% fewer ewe losses. Um, at Chogask in Northern Ireland, they have found, um, sorry, in Ireland, they have found that achieving condition score targets at tupping time, so moving from a two to a three, 
one condition score is worth 10% more lambs reared. So not just more lambs scanned, but more lambs uh, successfully kept through pregnancy and through until weaning time. So that is significant. And then I'm just showing this French slide here, um, which showed that again, 17% more lambs reared in this instance, 0.6 kilos greater carcass weight found. Um, and this equated to 24 euros greater margin per U. And there's a whole host of other research I could draw upon. And it's all really stacking up, really adding to the evidence that condition scoring really is valuable to the flock. So bringing it all together, um, I've just made a quick assumption of baseline sort of rearing rate at 160% and carcass weight to 18 kilos. And um, the research, so from, um, from France, showing 0.6 kilos um, added to the carcass weight, well, that's worth three pounds and 12 pence per lamb. 10% more lambs for this rearing rate, that's worth um, 1,000, you know, uh, 1,500, nearly 50 pounds. So that's substantial. And 5% fewer replacements or more cull use that haven't been lost to mortality. That's substantial again. So you can see how it all stacks up to be worth um, nearly 20 pounds per U in margin. So U condition scoring is certainly worthwhile, but not just condition scoring, but also um, correcting management to ensure that those that are lean are getting onto target as quickly as possible. And I've put in quite conservative assumptions, well, for current prices anyways, for lamb price and, and replacement prices to come up with these. So with greater lamb price, this, these benefits add up even further. So condition scoring, um, I've heard you probably, some of you uh, did a condition scoring session um, at the last Women in Ag meeting, but um, there's a great FAS technical note, body condition scoring of mat uh, mature sheep, which is available online. Um, and basically you're feeling these along these short ribs or horizontal processes, and you're feeling along the spine of the ewe's back. The way I kind of think about it is if you're looking, um, if you're feeling the ribs and think of them like your fingers, and if you can get, if there's a lot of space between the ribs and they feel sharp and pointy, that's a condition score one. If they're starting to feel a bit more rounded, but you can still get your fingers between them, like my, my knuckles are shown, that's a condition score two. And then three would feel more like um, more rounded again, but less easy to get my fingers between them. And, and then four, it was really difficult, really challenging to find those ribs. Or another thing I, I consider is if I can easily get my fingers underneath the short ribs, then that's indication that there are less than a condition score three. So there's these sort of indicators, I guess, um, to help um, get your eye in, because we recognize the method is subjective, but it's something that's really as valuable to check that the nutrition is right, but also to maximize the, the flock performance, as I've just shown. Um, and in terms of targets, they're different, they're slightly different for the hill breeds versus the um, more upland situation in the lowland systems. But like I said, getting them, I mean, maybe using the scores isn't um, always advantageous when it's subjective, but not, not too fat, not too thin, as much as possible, really. Um, and, and making sure that the range within the flock, as many as possible, are on target is highly uh, beneficial as well. So you can do these simple tally charts while you're going through them, just in, putting a cross next to where they come um, in terms of the score. And then trying to get as many as possible, I think they say about um, 90% where at, at topping time in this narrow range of condition scores. Um, sorry, one moment. And then just, you might ask when's most important to condition score? Well, I think the most valuable time and the, most, the time where you can um, make the greatest difference is in between weaning and topping time. And that's because they, we're not asking much of the ewes at the time. They're not lactating. They're not growing a, a lamb inside them. So that's when we can condition score them and manage them in groups of those that are too fat and those that are too thin. Um, and then go through them again, perhaps at, at after four weeks, to try and get as many as possible at target at, um, at topping time. Now, I know that time has passed for many. However, um, the next time to go through them uh, would be at scanning time. 
Um, and then again, managing those that are lean um, would be uh, managed in perhaps with the, the ones with greater multiples. So say the lean twins, go in with the triplets so they can be fed like a triplet bearing you. And then those fat twins, for instance, might go in with the singles so they can be fed um, a bit leaner to get, again, get as many on target as possible. Um, for lambing time, at a condition score around three for most. Um, so that's, well, two and a half to three. So that's um, condition scoring. And I know many of you will have done a bit before, but I just wanted to just reinforce the importance of that. Um, and before we come on to what Mary is going to talk about, which is nutrition. Thank you. If there are any questions, fire away. Cool. Are, are there any questions for Poppy before I fire on? No, maybe not. <laughs> Sorry, I just realised I can check the chat as well. <laughs> yeah, Mary, I think the chat's pretty quiet at the minute. So okay. feel free just to, hopefully everybody's cottoned on to and gotten the conditions going. So yeah, feel free just to keep going. No problem. Thank you, Stacey. Um, yeah, I think Poppy set that up quite nicely for me, um, sort of sets the scene, condition scoring and how you can monitor your nutrition. It's the easiest tool that you have to monitor how your nutrition is working. Um, so I wanted to just go through a bit of the nutritional requirements and what we're trying to achieve, really. So my first slide here is just an overview of the, the sheep's digestive system. Um, don't, don't worry, not going into too much theory, but I just wanted to sort of give a, a picture of what we're trying to achieve when we're feeding the ewe um, and why it's so important to satisfy the rumen. Um, so in my nice simplified diagram here, I don't know if you've ever been in a vet PM room, but if, if you've ever seen a rumen before a real rumen, it is quite a, a massive organ <laughs> structure. It's quite, quite impressive to see. Um, but that is the, the main part of the digestive system of the sheep. Um, so you'll see here I've got some rumen bugs floating around here and this is what breaks down the feed so it will mainly be grass or hay or silage in the winter time that that's what the rumen bugs are breaking down um uh, when it, whenever they're digesting their feed uh so it's, it's not so much the sheep itself that um that digests it uh, it's these these relationship with the bugs that um provides their energy and protein um, so here I've got my what we call degradable protein uh, in nutrition. So this is urea is a, an example of 100 percent degradable protein. Uh, other good sources of degradable protein are things like your silage, your grass um, will be mainly degradable protein. So when they ingest their grass, that's the degradable protein that's been broken down. And they also receive energy from your grass as well. And that's what the rumen bugs use. They capture the degradable protein using the energy and they make what's called microbial protein. So for you in early pregnancy, most of her protein requirements will be made up by what we call microbial protein. Um, and that, that should satisfy most of her requirements. Unless she's on the thin side, she may, she may need a bit of additional, but generally microbial protein is sufficient in early to mid-pregnancy. Mid um, we then got what we call DUP. I think that's been a bit of a buzzword over the past but a few years, especially a lot of the work that John Vipon's done. So this is the digestible, undegradable protein, which is, again, another important source of protein, um, particularly in late pregnancy when her protein requirements go up quite substantially. But it's so important not to forget your degradable protein as well. I've seen a lot. I'll, I'll show you in a wee minute just the silages that have been coming through and how they've analyzed, but um, some of them can be lower in protein and may not fully satisfy the degradable needs um, of the bugs. Um, so it's really important you've got that baseline right, what's coming from forage. Um, and I'll, I'll chat a bit through how you can work that out if, if your forage is sufficient and, and what you need to be looking at. Um, so really the objective is to optimize your contribution from forage as much as possible. So in order to do that, the first thing you need is your silage or your hay analyzed. So that's essential to be able to assess the potential. When someone comes to me and asks for a ration and just tells me to base it on average figures, uh, I'll show you in a minute what our average figures are, but the range is just so massive. It really depends on, on when it was cut, you know, if it was taken 
before the Highland show or after the Highland show. That's quite often when, when people mark when their silage was taken. Um, what the weather was like has such a big effect on the dry matter of your silage, uh, what your fertilizer applications were like, just so many variables when it comes to making forage. Um, so it's so important that you get yours analyzed. So the aim is to optimize the forage intake. Um, so feed access, of course, comes into that. That's really important. Um, a lot of the rations, if I do a ration on paper, and give it to someone. Uh, what I want to see when I'm out on farm is what, what's their access like? Um, because you can make a great ration, give it to someone, but if the animal's not physically eating that, um, Quite quickly, you'll see that um, they'll they'll start. You know, body condition score will will reduce, um, and and it can be so simple, just things like introducing another ring feeder or um, not having the bale pushed up at one end. You know, rolling the bale out. Uh, it's, uh, it's just so important um, for your rations. And complementing your forage with the minimal amount of supplement. And, and I know this year it's a big topic of conversation. Obviously, feed prices have increased. Um, and, and we want to be obviously making sure the animal's getting what it needs for its health and welfare and um, to produce those high vigorous lambs. Um, but also that, you know, you're not overloading them with supplements or if your forage has analysed better than maybe um, it has in previous years where you can make savings in, in your supplements. Um, so it's really important once you've got your forage analysed, as I was saying earlier, some silage is maybe slightly lower in protein. So making sure you have the correct type and quality of supplement. Um, if you do find your forage has perhaps lower in energy or, or lower in protein, then looking at what can you do um, to, to correct that and to, to optimize your forage uh, and really complement it um, so the animal is still getting what it requires. Um, the other thing in you nutrition, this is taken from feeding the you this uh, diagram. I think it shows it quite nicely um, of, of why you don't want to be overloading them with concentrates. Um, the, the rumen, as I said, is obviously the biggest digestive organ in the in the you, and it has a very stable pH that the bugs like, uh, and that's really what it's all about: is keeping these bugs happy. So when you feed your ewe roll or your barley, for example, that's quite high in starch, that uh, drops the rumen pH. So the bugs digest the, the ewe roll and they break that up and that creates this acidic pH. Um, so if you're feeding, for example, twice daily, you can see you get this drop from around about seven, so quite a neutral pH, and it can drop to around five and a half. Um, and then in this sort of area, that's where cellulose digestion, so cellulose is your, your grass um, or, your, or your silage or your hay, and the, the bugs aren't able to perform at their maximum capacity at that. Um, so, so one thing that's become more popular in sheep production, and, and I know it can't work on every system, not everyone has the facilities, but total mix rations or TMR feeding has become more popular over the years, especially as people are making higher quality silage. Um, and it just helps maintain that nice six and a half sort of stable pH and you don't get these dramatic dips um, in, in the rumen and get the fluctuations and, and things like acidosis that we talk about sometimes in nutrition. That's when they get into this sort of risk uh, level of below uh, five pH of about five and and that is where the cellulose isn't digesting uh, as well as it could be. Uh, so these this is just an overview of the silages that have come through to the SAC lab and um, so silages that have come from I think July time through to the end of October. This is how they've looked so far. Apologies it looks like quite a lot of information. I've tried to just um, not show too many figures, but I've given the sort of top ones that people tend to look for on your silage analysis. Um, so your dry matter, uh, your ME is your metabolizable energy, uh, your crude protein, your neutral detergent fiber, and SIP is your silage intake potential. Uh, so the, the first column there gives all the silage average. Uh, so all the silages, that's from beef and sheep uh, and dairy. 
farms and they're all a mixture of pit and veal. Uh, so you can see there's quite a massive range there in the brackets. The overall dry matter this year has been higher, so about 350 grams per kilo on an average, but a massive variation. Some as low as 142 and some as high as 700. So you're getting into more your haylage, um, almost a hay type there. Um, the first cut pit and the second cut pit, these are just beef and sheep silages. Um, I just wanted to show the, the differences in the energy and protein values. And to be honest, on an energy basis, they are quite similar between the first and second cuts. Generally, you expect the second cuts might be a bit stemmier and slightly lower in energy, but actually they've compared quite well on average uh, to the first cuts in energy. Uh, the difference in crude protein between the first cuts and second cuts is quite interesting. And I, I don't know if that was a consequence of the quite dry conditions whenever the first cuts were taken, um, perhaps fertilizer wasn't taken up. Um, but certainly from a nutritional point of view, that's important to know if you're working with, um, you know, your pit or bales from first cut and then moving through to your second cut or vice versa, moving from your second cut to first cut, the difference that will make nutritionally uh, to your rations, this, that, that protein difference. So again, important why you should get them analyzed. Um, the NDF, that's sort of linked to your energy as well. So average there of about 495, um, it's fairly standard for, for silage. Uh, the SIP value there of 103, we, we tend to use 90 as about an average. Um, so anything over 90 indicates that they'll probably eat a bit more. Um, so drier silages do tend to have a higher SIP value uh, and cheap do perform quite well in silages at about 30%. But if they get too dry, you can see intakes can, and especially sorting with sheep can be an issue. Um, if they're quite high dry matter silages, um, above that you can find their intakes may slightly reduce. Um, but yeah, that, that was the overall sort of picture of what we've seen so far. Obviously lots of different types of conserved forages might be used, your, your haylage, uh, different dry matters and nutritional qualities. So it really depends on time of making and as I was saying, quality of the grass. Uh, and hay is the same as well. You can get a range of quality of energy and protein. Um, I have seen a few hays that have come into me um, that have been analyzed on wet chemistry that have been as low as sort of 50 grams uh, per kilo of crude protein. So th those hays are really needing some good high protein sources like a 20% U rule, something like that, just to compensate for the lower uh, protein in that hay. Uh, but so variable as well. And I think because of the drier weather, a lot more hay will have been cut this year. Um, so more people might be, be feeding hay. So it's important to get that analysed as well. Uh, straw rations, I don't tend to actually do a lot of straw rations on ewes, but I know people do feed straw as pregnant ewes as well. But so important that you get that balanced correctly because straw is so low in protein and energy. So it needs really careful supplementation. I didn't mention minerals and vitamins, but that's another really important one, making sure that's tailored to a straw-based ration. Um, so the, the timeline that Poppy showed sets up quite nicely just to go through requirements. Um, the first stage is sort of mid-pregnancy, so months two and three. So I think we've kind of forgotten about sometimes that can kind of be brushed over that late pregnancy is, as Poppy said, the golden 35 days, which is really important. Um, but where we're at right now, thinking about mid-pregnancy, this is when the placenta starts to develop uh, and can be susceptible to undernutrition. Previously, advice was that this could also be a period that you could take off a little bit of condition. But I think you do have to be careful. Um, if they are quite fit, you know, over condition score four or five, a little bit of condition off probably isn't going to be uh, too detrimental. But I would say if you have them in good, good condition and you want to just keep them on that level plane of nutrition and supplement where, where necessary, for example, in extreme weather conditions, um, when we were having this talk, I thought it's probably a bit too early to talk about snow. And then it snowed last week. So actually, um, you just never know. 
So always important to have your plan B in nutrition as well. Um, but loss in body condition score can impact youth performance, your lamb growth and birth weight. Obviously, the placenta provides so much nutrition to the lamb. So any mild underfeeding, um, sorry, loss of uh, body condition score can really impact um, nutrition to that growing fetus. Um, so yes, as Poppy said, a scan at 50 to 90 days, and that's a good time to, again, body condition score and separate out your thin use, your, your triplets um, and single and fit twins. That's uh, an ideal time to be body condition scoring again. So the, the next stage is in your sort of late pregnancy. So I like in the QMS timeline that it splits everything up quite nicely into 50 day periods and, and what are the special golden days that you really need to target. Um, this graph is quite good as well. I think this was another one from Feeding the U, but it just shows the demand on the U as you get to six weeks pre-lambing. Um, it's only 25% of its final weight, which is six weeks ago. So it's, it's a massive demand in those last six weeks. So you can see why her nutrition has to be you know, so good um, just to make sure that the, the lamb growth is maintained without um, detriment to herself. So 50% of her birth, sorry, the lamb's birth weight put down in the last three weeks. You've also got the woolly coat um, that grows in the last week as well. So that's where your high demand for protein as well comes from. And uh, so it's essential that you're uh, feeding your highest quality feeds with good high intakes to, to meet all these demands uh, in that late stage. Uh, this is another graph I quite like using in these talks because I think it just shows it quite nicely, depending on the quality of your silage, um, what, where it needs to be supplemented or, or where you might be lacking uh, in energy. So the red line here, it shows for a seven, 75 kilo U that's carrying twins, what her full requirement is, um, weeks pre-lambing along the bottom there. The green line is if she's in quite fit condition, so above a three and a half uh, condition score. So she's losing probably about 80 grams of live weight a day on, on that green line. Um, so if she is in quite good condition and you're feeding an average hay, just realise I've been pointing with my finger and no one can see my finger. <laughs> so using my mouse, um, average hay uh, at about eight weeks pre-lambing for quite a fit you she's going to need supplementation at this point um so that's either feeds from from straights or your your classic you rules um that that's where she's needing a bit of supplementation and you can see on a good silage so this is silage that's above 10 and a half me so really good high energy levels um you're actually only needing to supplement at about four weeks pre-lambing but we'll preface that that's on a you know a, a sorry, are you in good condition? Um, it really does depend on what condition they're, they're in at that point. Um, but yes, a good silage, if you're getting the intakes, should be able to maintain a U up to about four weeks pre-lambing. Um, so options in late pregnancy. So target body condition score is about a three, two and a half to three. As Poppy said, you don't want to overcomplicate it. It's not too fat, not too thin, just somewhere in the middle. So at, at that target body condition score, looking at the graphs, um, what, what graphs has come through, obviously, um, when spring comes, has a, a big effect on the weather as well. But grass over four centimetres and growing should be sufficient uh, in late pregnancy to, um, to maintain the U. For a silage that's analysed about 10 and a half or above, um, as I said from that previous graph, that should be enough in late pregnancy, um, plus a source of this DUP, this uh, bypass protein that's not broken down by the bugs. Um, so the 100 grams of soya, or I've also mentioned protected rapeseed meal, because a lot of these products are becoming more popular now. Um, which is a protected rapeseed meal. It's basically um, been heat treated or cold pressed that it um, increases the level of bypass protein um, and makes it comparable to soya. Um, so sort of rule of thumb is about 100 grams per lamb carried. Uh, so for twins, about 200 grams of soya or a protected rapeseed meal. 
the signage that's less than 10 and a half. Um, so I didn't actually show that on that graph. I didn't go through that, but that's more of an average sort of signage or kind of poor if it's less than 10 and a half. Uh, you're also going to need an additional energy source. So either the traditional, you know, 18% U rule that's good high energy or using um, digestible fiber sources that are high in energy like sugar beet pulp or oats or whole barley and then adding your additional bypass protein as well. I've got some example rations here. This is just some typical silage rations based on a pretty average silage. Um, so this is for a 75 kilogram U and it shows what her supplementation um, from concentrate is at eight to two weeks pre-lambing. So you can see for those that are carrying singles, they're not really needing any supplementation at this point. But as you get that bit closer to lambing at about four weeks, they're going to need a wee bit of extra energy and protein. The triplets, they need to be looked after, obviously, because their energy requirements are that much higher when they're growing three fetuses. So starting feeding a little bit earlier um, for your triplets uh, and slowly increasing that. Um, so step up rate rations work quite well just to slowly introduce concentrates. Um, I, I was chatting to someone recently as well who was trying to balance a silage that was quite high in energy but low in protein. And what we find that the step up rate didn't really work in that scenario, uh, just because as you were quite far off in lambing, you were going to be given too much energy on your traditional 18% U rule. Um, so on a flat rate system where you're just feeding the same amount of concentrate um, sort of in that last six weeks pre lambing, that can work quite nicely. And it worked nicely in this system. Uh, where they were finding it quite difficult to you know, balance the energy and protein. Um, so flat rate, you're, you're feeding to the same amount as about four weeks pre-lambing, um, but from six weeks. Uh, so you'll be slightly overfeeding at the start and then slightly underfeeding as you get closer to lambing, but it levels out and you're not having to overload them with concentrates as you get up to that sort of two weeks pre-lambing. So that can work quite nicely, the system. If they're quite thin, if they're um, quite low body condition score, then they may not cope on a flat rate feeding system. So that's my only sort of caveat with that, um, that as you get closer to lambing, those that are thinner might not be a great system on flat rate. Um, and this is some typical hay rations. So hay tends to only be, um, compared to silage, it's a little bit lower in energy. So it tends to usually be about nine megajoules um, of ME and about 9% crude pr protein or 90 grams per kilo dry matter. Uh, so you will need to supplement slightly earlier uh, with your hay. Uh, you can see even with singles, they're needing a little bit of supplementation even at eight weeks pre-lambing uh, and just building that up slowly. And same with your triplets as well. Um, so just have a, a quick exercise as well. I've obviously talked a bit about um, your traditional U rules. So I know quite a lot of people will be using that. Um, and obviously with prices, as I said, you want to make sure you're getting the best quality and what you should be looking for um, is important to know. So I've just put some notes here on, on what to look for and when when you're assessing different feed labels um, from a feed company, what, what are the sort of top things to look for? So these are the things that will be declared on the, the back of the label. Um, generally, oil, you want to be between sort of four and five percent. Most feed compounders won't really go higher than that because, the, you know, they want the rule to stick together well. So if you, you put too much in, it will make it, uh, you know, kind of crumble a little bit. Um, so about four to five percent of oil, ash less than 10%. Um, so your ash refers to the mineral content of, of the feed um, and things like calcium carbonate is a bit of a filler. So if that's quite high, your ash content might be quite high. Um, so you generally don't want it to, to be over 10%. On the label, it doesn't generally, um, as I was showing you the silage analysis there with metabolizable energy, uh, the, the labels don't have to declare, sorry, the feed compounders don't have to declare um, what the metabolizable energy is. Um, so a good gauge of what the energy content is like is to look at the fiber content. Um, 
So it's if it's over 10%, that would indicate there's quite a lot of filler feeds in there. Um, things like oat feed, palm kernel. Um, you don't want to see those high up uh, in the list or, or high fiber content. And crude protein is always expressed as, as required or on a fresh weight basis, um, which is probably more for the nutritionist to know whenever you're working out your rations. That can uh, be very important just to know that it's on a fresh weight um, rather than on dry matter basis, as, as was shown in all the silage analysis that was expressed on a dry matter basis. Um, and the other thing is the list of ingredients. So it's shown in descending order of inclusion. So as I mentioned, things like uh, oat feed, sunflower pellets, um, malt coombs, things like that, if they're quite high up in the list, um, that's an indication, you know, if oat feeds first on the list, it's an indication it's not going to be a high energy feed. So things that you do want to see are um, things like your high energy uh, distillers grains. Those are really good high energy and good sources of protein. Cereals as well, things like your um, barley and oats um, and your peas and beans, are also good sources of energy and protein. Um, so avoiding oat feed at, at the top, definitely. Um, oh, yes, I forgot I put this slide in as well. So this is some lower starch energy sources. Um, so when I was showing that graph before, of how pH can drop um, as, as you introduce feed, concentrate feed, um, trying to reduce the starch content uh, so it doesn't drop uh, as dramatically the pH. So things that are lower in starch, but still good high energy feeds are your distillers grains, uh, pot eel syrup, soya bean meal and sugar beet pulp. Um, although I know sugar beet pulp is quite high this year in, in value, but soya hulls as well, that's another good um, lower starch alternative. Ones that are sort of moderate in starch level are your oats, peas and beans, and, and your higher starch content feeds will be things like potatoes, maize and barley and wheat. Um, and I put a note there just to be aware of excess processing. Um, generally with sheep, we tend to feed cereals whole just to reduce that starch load and how quickly it gets degraded in the rumen. Uh, and obviously they can chew much better than cattle can. Um, but particularly with wheat, it's a bit more fizzy in the rumen than in your barley or oats. Um, so you just have to be careful if you're feeding these straight. Uh, so here's an example of a compound feed. You can see it's got my animal analytical constituents. So that's my oil, my protein, my fiber content. So those are the kind of main things that I would look over first and then go straight into the ingredients. So I can see I've got barley, still a start grains, all looks good. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention was molasses is another good thing to look for on the list. Uh, it tends to be in at about two to five percent. Um, again, it's there to sort of stick the pellets or the rolls together. So you don't want that to be too high or else you'll get crumbling of the roll. So anything less than molasses on the list um, tends to be in smaller amounts. So that would be your minerals and your trace elements. Uh, so in this case, I've got soya hulls and high pro soya being uh, after my molasses. So they might be in slightly smaller amounts, which would indicate there's maybe not that much bypass protein in this um, compound feed. Um, but yeah, all, all different things you can look for. And obviously the minerals, magnesium and sodium are stated there as well. Um, so I've got two example labels here and I was going to ask if people wouldn't mind just having a look at label one first and then I'll show you label two. And then if you can pop in the chat, which of the feeds you think is the better quality feed. Um, so label one or label two. So I'll let you have a look at label one first. So this is a U-roll 18% crude protein. Should also say ignore whatever name they give their feed. If it's super amazing U 18%. The name doesn't really mean anything. It's all a marketing spin, but um, of course they can be super U amazing rules. Um, definitely can, but it doesn't really tell you much about the quality of the feed. Uh, in the name so ju just be careful not to be taken in by the name and a lot of people probably just look at an 18% crude protein 
And that's that's what they want is the 18% crude protein. But bearing in mind, the energy content is also really important, as I showed in that late pregnancy. You, know, you want to be getting the best in. <clears throat> best feeds in with the best high energy. So 12 and a half ME is generally what we would say is a minimum in late pregnancy. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to, sorry, I've babbled a bit <laughs> during that as well, but hopefully you've had a chance to read through label one, um, have a look at what's in the top uh, few ingredients on the list. Uh, and then I'll show you label two. This is label two, which is a 16% crude protein U roll. It's a high energy euro, which will provide quality nutrition for the use in late pregnancy. So again, just have a look at what the ingredients are and what you think of that compared to the first label, um, which you think is the better quality. So they're typing in the chat one or two. Is that what you said? Yes. Sorry. Yes. So if you could... Just type in. Oh, excellent. I'm seeing seeing some pop up. So most are preferring label one. Mary, just while we're waiting on that, <clears throat> um, everyone popping a feed in. Um, there was a good question come in on the subject of feeds from Julia, who was wondering what's better for feeding yow rolls or yow crunch. So that goes kind of goes back to the feed labeling thing, I suppose, doesn't it? And how it looks. Yeah, I, I would say um, having a look at what the quality is between the crunch and the rolls. And I suppose from a practical point of view as well, if you're chalk feeding, then you could use the sheep crunch. But if they're out outside, then the rolls might be easier to use. So there's sort of practicality points. Um, but I would always just look at what the, the quality is, depending on what's in the feeds. I know with sheep, they can be a bit more picky and can kind of pick through things a bit more. So I don't know if that, if the crunch is maybe not as good for that reason, because they might be able to sort it um, a little bit more. Um, but again, sorry, just reading the chat as well. Um, yes. Uh, if, if you're using TMR feeding as well, it's quite easy just to mix through with the silage and, and hopefully reduce sorting. But I would say, um, yeah, it just depends on your system probably. But hopefully those tips of what to look for will help. Do you have anything to add on that, Poppy? No, I was thinking the exact same, but I'm guessing rolls are potentially um, more likely to have these sort of filler, low quality filler ingredients that might be higher processed. So there might be that sort of, risk of starch overload, uh, grain overload of them as well. But yeah, it all comes back to quality, yeah. Yeah. Um, sorry, yeah, I think that's a really valid point on them being picky as well, because you know what they're like, even when they're grazing, they'll pick out the stuff they prefer. So with the rolls, they've just got to take it in a one hit as opposed to picking their way through the crunch. Yeah. Definitely. Perfect. Hopefully that's answered that one yeah so I think um most people have answered number one um I realized that I, I could have put two rolls that had the same crude protein level um because quite often a lot of them will you know sit at 18 percent but it doesn't really tell you much about the quality um apologies and go back to that first one um so obviously there's high levels of bypass protein. So we've got the ultra soy at the, the top there. So that's protected form of soya. So the DEP levels are going to be even higher than normal high pro soya. And it's also got sugar beet, which is a good high energy, but also fibrous feed. So it's not overloading them with starch. Um, so yeah, in the, the second one, if I move through to that, we've got wheat feed. I, I didn't mention that one, but wheat feed, it, it's not terrible it's about 11 and a half me but as i said we're really aiming for about 12 and a half as a minimum for use in late pregnancy so yeah not not an ideal feed to be top of the list and sunflower ham kernel as well again more of a filler type feed um so well done everyone picked that up <laughs> um 
So just some feeding guidelines, as I was saying, with those step up rate type rations, introducing feed slowly. So starting them off at about 0.25 kilos and then increasing that by about 50, 50 to 100 grams or 0.05 to 0.1 kilos a day. So you're building them up slowly. You're trying to avoid these big dramatic drops in pH of the rumen. And I would generally say no more than 0.45 kilos per feed. Um, so those typical rations that I showed for the silage and hay, once you were getting up to sort of two weeks pre-lambing, it was needing almost a kilo um, per head in some of those rations, particularly for the hay. Um, so splitting that over two feeds at least uh, just to reduce that. Um, grain overload or a, a risk of acidosis and as I mentioned feeding whole grains as well to, again to help reduce uh, the speed the starch is degraded at and the feed space requirements there as I was saying at the very start we want to optimize forage intake as much as possible um, so making sure good feed access so ad lib forage is about 15 centimeters per head uh, restricted forage they need a bit more um, so a, Generally, for, for use in, in pregnancy, you shouldn't be restricting their feeding um, but 25 centimetres per head. And for concentrates, to avoid um, the bully, <laughs> the one that's getting in ahead of everyone else, trying to give them a bit more space for their concentrates at 50 centimetres. So the, the shyer feeders and thin ewes are getting their allotted amount as well. And I think just a, quite a simple point, but an important one is, you know, calibrating what you're using to, to feed uh, the sheep. Quite often I just get told to get, you know, two shovelfuls a day, but what actually is a shovelful? Um, so, you know, weighing a bucket is, is quite a simple thing to do just to, to work out. In this example here, I just had about 10 kilos in this bucket and I've got my bathroom scales and luggage scales um, so just very quickly using those to to weigh your bucket out knowing this is how much uh, is in this and I can allot that to the group multiply what my ration says up for that group um, just to try and improve the accuracy of your feeding uh, and a few pre-lambing checks you can do so four weeks pre-lambing uh, things to do Metabolic profiling, uh, I think it's become more talked about uh, recently over the past few years, and I see it more commonly done um, in, in sheep. So it's a really good way, as well as body condition scoring, it's a good way to get direct feedback of your rations that it, if their energy levels or their protein levels aren't right, um, you, you, you'll pick that up really quickly in the bloods and be able to correct that before you get too close to lambing. So your BOHBs are what you'll get back from blood testing, which gives you your short-term energy balance. Um, so high levels would suggest you're in a negative energy balance. And lambs that are born to use with high BOHBs are found to have per colostral transfer, which would make sense if they're in negative energy balance. They're not producing um, good colostrum quality. Uh, there was work done at the University of Edinburgh that showed that ewes were five times more likely to have lambs with insufficient antibody levels. So again, that relates to the, the per colostrum transfer uh, to, to these lambs. Other markers that you can look at in the bloods are the urea. So that's your short term protein. Um, so that's their kind of current protein intake. So again, that can have impacts on their colostrum production and their immunity as well. I forgot, forgot to mention the importance of the immunity of the, the U in late pregnancy. She's like got all these other challenges and immunity can be knocked off quite quickly if she's not got uh, good protein intake. And the last thing is the albumin, so that's your long-term protein balance. Um, so if they've been in kind of prolonged under nutrition of protein that that can show up in their bloods or if they've had liver damage uh, from things like fluke or, or blood loss uh, and again work by the same work at the University of Edinburgh find a link between the low albumin and an increase in lamb mortality um, so yeah good, good things to use to check how your nutrition is looking uh, and get direct feedback and, and of course your body condition scoring as well for things you can assess on farm quite quickly and I think that's my last slide so I'll pass back over to Poppy
Um, or if there's any questions, sorry, um, can take questions as well. Yeah, just before we go back to Poppy, there was a question in the <clears throat> in the chat, Mary, um, from Fiona asking, does feed space increase in triplets versus single bearing yells? Should that be a consideration? Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. I would imagine it would increase um, because obviously they're going to be wider. Um, do, do you know if there's a yeah. <laughs> a recommendation tend, copy. I, I looked I looked into it, but we tend to keep things simple. So large use, like 79 to 90 kilos would get 50 centimeters, and then smaller use, so 50 to 70 kilos would get 45 centimeters. But so I don't uh, yeah, we tend to keep the guidance simple, but it wouldn't be a bad idea to give a bit more space to triplets, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Thanks for that, Mary. Um so Mary's gone into quite a lot of detail about the nutrition and now I thought we'd sort of fast forward again to the day of, of birth of these lambs and what we're trying to really achieve, what this is all culminating in, I guess. And that is really, um, to start with, it's the lamb being born uh, with as minimal assistance and intervention as, as possible. And then the lamb standing up and getting that rapid intake of that all important colostrum. And that's key to that's one of the most key steps to the lamb's survival and um, it provides the lamb with nutrition it gives it the ability to generate heat and um, so particularly on on colder weathers it's, it can be a, a big um, a turning point as to whether they survive or not and it prevents starvation it plays a key role in the ewe lamb bonding to help ensure that those ewes and lambs stay close together um, for uh, to ensure their lamb protection um, and that means that they're less vulnerable to predation and then as I'm sure you're all aware it's the immunoglobulins and um, that protect the lamb from infectious disease that is uh, that is beneficial from this colostrum so this is key and nutrition is a good starting point from that making sure they're in good condition and making sure their nutrition in those golden 35 days is key and um, other aspects to it is, um, and like I say, the passive transfer of, of immunity. So nutrition, um, the lambs that the, the ewes had, so we know that twins and triplet bearing lambs produce more colostrum than single air bearing ewes. And then there is a genetic element there as well, which I'll not go into too much detail today, simply because um, there's not much you can do about it in this year, and it's probably another webinar in itself. Um, so that's on the ewe side. However, it's important that this lamb, as, as we've described, is vigorous to stand up and suckle on its own. And again, nutrition is a big part of that. Um, oh gosh, sorry, back. How do I go back? Uh, that's that one. Um, so nutrition is a big part of that. Genetics is a big part of that. But that's when environment comes to uh, play a part as well. Um, so, and that's when stress has an influence. So, I think I'm missing a slide, sorry. Um, so what happens is um, on the day of birth, um, the U has to ensure that the environment is safe enough before she actually deems it um, safe to give birth to that lamb. So she'll wait for, uh, for up to 24 hours until she feels that that environment is safe enough. And if that she perceives that environment to be too stressful, if there's too much going on, if it's in the shed or outside, if there is uh, predation, if there's disturbance for other reasons, she'll say, or she'll try and protect it for as long as possible. And that's problematic because that's stressful on the you, and it means that when she does finally give birth, she's going to be um, more stressed and let her maternal behaviour will be impaired. And then also it's, it could potentially uh, starve the lamb's brain of oxygen when it, and it finally comes through, and then that affects its vigour. So having the environment as stress-free as possible to ensure that that um, reaction where the, the you gives birth is as quickly and as calmly as possible, it's all contributing to the success of that lamb standing up and suckling on its own without the need of intervention to make sure it gets an all important colostrum. 
So to create a stress-free environment, it really comes back to the basics of keeping the shed or making sure the outdoor environment is disturbed as little as possible. So sheep, sheep um, they like calm, predictable and quiet environments. They like to be fed at the same time every day. They um, don't like to be mixed too frequently with other ewes because they'll have to sort of restore the, the pecking order as it was were between them. Um, and they don't like too much disturbance. So minimizing that is important. They, again, stocking, if they're too highly stocked in a pen, they'll deem that more stressful. Um, they don't like, obviously, dogs too much. They don't like much loud or extrovert handling and too much novelty. Um, uh, Kathy Dwyer, who's a, a behavioral researcher at SRUC, she will talk even, um, they'll uh, notice you change, when you change the color of your hat, for instance, um, which I took too literally one year and just kept the same hat throughout lambing time, um, just so they uh, didn't get scared. But they, they, they notice a lot more than you think. They're more intelligent than we give them credit for, um, and they are more sensitive than we think as well. So minimizing stress and Mary's talks about um, making sure they've got enough quality feed in front of them. And she's talked about that trough space because again, that comes back to, um, to stress. If they haven't been aggressive to get to that all important feed, then that's uh, added stress. And in fact, we've noticed um, farmers that are feeding more ad lib versus um, uh, twice day feeding or once day feeding they're able to feed quality stuff ad lib. We've actually found that um, they exhibit more uh, lambing during the day rather than at night. And if we look back to sheep in the wild, that would be their natural preference. So if there's a lot of lambing at nighttime, that's indicative that the this environment in the shed is too stressful through the day. Um, and should, we should be trying to, particularly if you don't want to, um, have to deal with a mess when you get to the shed in the morning or if you don't want to have to worry about looking at them too frequently trying to keep that environment as stress-free as possible will lead to more and um, more lambs being born during the day so just to reiterate that's the the trough spaces uh, recommendations and um, for small and large use and then yeah like mary said we we thought we'd best put in a little bit about uh, planning for snow um, I hope, no, well, there's been a horrible storm for many uh, this last weekend, and I hope you weren't all too badly hit with that. Um, and it is tricky. The weather is becoming more and more unpredictable, and it is always going to be a challenge. Um, but what all we can do is, all we can do, we can just do the best we can to prepare for these challenges. And the more we plan ahead and communicate with the other staff and this plan, the less stressful and more prepared we'll be for these occasions. I think a really key point is training young stocks or training hogs to eat so that when it, these extreme events do occur, they're not um, wasting days losing weight as they learn the feed um, that you're putting in front of them. Um, so a useful time to train hogs would be in the autumn time. Um, if they're pregnant, wait till about uh, a month after the top has been introduced with the ewes. And if they're not pregnant, well, it's easier again. So just putting that feed in front of them um, on a bare, relatively bare paddock just to get them used to it. Um, I think if possible, I know it's not always possible, but trying to get ahead of the bad weather, looking at the forecast, if there's a heavy snow, um, snow um, storm forecast, then um, seeing if you can bring the ewes closer to home, seeing if you could bring them into more sheltered or more free drained fields, fields with better access where you can um, feed them from, um, making sure there's plenty of water provided. Um, and also they tend to eat more prior to the storm occurring. So feeding them a bit before the storm occurs um, might be beneficial because during the storm, they'll eat less because they're stressed. So that might help prevent any loss of condition at that time. Um, and like, I think what's really key when we're planning these things out is trying to avoid any sort of knee jerk reactions, right? We'll quickly get the use in the shed because that will uh, stress them from an environment where perhaps they're on a, just a forage based diet and then they're going into the shed, they've got the stress of going into the shed and then they've got the feed transition and you might be prone to um, 
metabolic issues in those ewes. So keeping in mind, yes, you're having to react quite fast, but that transition of feed is still going to be important. As Mary described, making sure that, you know, you're starting at no more than 250 a quarter of a kilo to start with and you transition them up. And again, that's why looking at the forecast and trying to get ahead of it will help with that transition. I know easier said than done. And, and then I'll just show you sort of an example of how we might calculate the requirements for three weeks bad weather, because it's never a bad idea to have in that forage on hand, because when you do, um, if you are hit and you are going to buy, you, inevitably it's going to be really expensive or really difficult to source. So having that forage on hand for that plan B, should that um, bad weather hit, um, is definitely recommended. So I've just done that quick calculation here. So for those pre-scanning, they don't require as much as Mary showed their energy requirements um, during early pre pregnancy are relatively low. So we often allocate on a percentage of their body weight per day. So pre-scanning, pre I would allocate roughly 2% of their body weight, post-scanning 3% of their body weight, which is including some allowance for wastage in there. Um, so that equates for a 70 kilo U, that will mean 1.4 kilos of dry matter pre-scanning, 2.1 kilos of dry matter post-scanning. So that equates to, in terms of fresh weight, 5.6 kilos, 8.4. And um, that's based on an average silage, 25% dry matter. Um, or for those feeding hay, that would be um, 1.6 kilos or 2.5. And then what that means in terms of bales for three weeks, um, so it's 0.117, let's say, bales for um, 700 kilo bales of uh, silage per U or post scanning 0.25 and then hay if I'm working on 250 kilo bales. So obviously I would want you to adjust these according to the sort of types of forage you're using but just to give an example so for 100 U's we're talking about 17 bales for three weeks pre-scanning, 25 bales for three weeks post scanning and for 100 U's in terms of hay talking about 14 bales for three weeks versus 20 bales or 21 bales if we're rounding up. So it's always good to do that sort of calculation to um, make sure you've got enough on hand should the worst occur. So hopefully that's given you some food for thought. Um, I think just to summarize what we've described anyways, I think that new nutrition timeline covers quite a lot and just hones in the mind on a lot of the, the aspects that Mary and I have discussed tonight. So worthwhile requesting one from QMS. I hopefully I put across how valuable condition scoring is. I know it's tricky because it's subjective and you have to get using and, and all the rest, but it's worth nearly 20 pounds a year. And I think that is, and you know, if you're thinking welfare, you think in other aspects as well, it certainly is worth it to make sure that we are validating, you're checking that the feeding and the management is right. Um, as Mary's put across, respect to the rumen, it doesn't like quick changes. Um, so making sure that we're, we're um, and it doesn't like too high a starch, as Mary described, so making sure we're respecting that environment. And um, the golden 35 days pre lambing, that's where there should be a lot of focus. That's where the most, the most influential period in terms of lamb mortality. And it will also be influential to colostrum and, um, and size of lambs and bigger of lambs. You've all shown yourself to be excellent at reading the feed labels. So, yeah, fantastic. And hopefully I've put across um, why it's important to minimize stress in the shed or outside for yourselves and, and for the sheep. And planning ahead is always valuable. So thank you very much for listening to us this evening. And if you have any questions, please fire away. Yeah, I'd just like to thank um, Mary and Poppy for their time this evening. Uh, really good informative sessions. Um, hopefully you'll all agree. Lamin's not that far away from some of us that are, you know, in amongst pedigree stuff. It'll be coming around soon and even the early lammers as well. So it's definitely the time to be thinking about it uh, for all stages of pregnancy. And I had wrote, written a little few bullet points summary, but Poppy's covered everything pretty much that I was using as your take home messages anyway. Um, so we've just got, um, Lorna's just messaged if we have copies of the slides we can send out to participants. 
So I think, Emma, were you were maybe gathering some bits and bobs we could send to people. Is that right? What all we were going to put slides around and yeah, thank the timeline. Yeah, absolutely. I can all the um, documents that have been spoken about this evening. I'll pop them all onto an email and send them out to everybody who's attended. Um, so, um, but if you find there's nothing in that list that you know that you're looking for, then let me know and we can try and find it for you. Perfect. Uh, yeah, I found it really, um, really intriguing to find that sheep pay more attention to the colour of your hat than you think. So bear that in mind next time for the lamb and shed. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks everybody for joining. I've, it's been a, what I think a really good session. So hopefully everybody's got something to take away from it. Um, and that's us for this evening. So yeah, thanks for coming and we'll see you again soon at one of our next meetings, hopefully. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. No bother. Um, yeah, any other last minute questions or open mics, feel free. We've got a little bit of time. Um, other than that, feel free just to, to leave the meeting.